I was very honored to be invited to come here and, and talk to you about my favorite topic, interferometry. Well, I think we all know that you can't make anything any better than what you can measure it, how well you can test it. And I think in John Taylor's talk just before lunch, we saw how important interferometry can be to the testing of, of components. And so I want to spend the next half hour talking uh, about interferometry. And I'm going to start out with a short history, actually a very short history of interferometry. And then I'm going to talk about the basic instrument, uh, a basic instrument for measuring surface roughness and talk about two types of uh, interferometric height measurements. Uh, phase shifting, which is going to give us a very high precision, and the vertical scanning coherence probe technique, which will give us a large dynamic range, and then the two together can give us both high precision and a large dynamic range. And then the last item I want to talk about here is probably the, the biggest limitation of interferometry uh, is uh, set by the environment. And I want to talk about some work that people are doing on uh, vibration compensation that hopefully will open up the areas that interferometry can be used. Well, interferometry is certainly not new. Uh, the basic uh, Fizeau-type interferometer was introduced back in something like 1862. And this instrument now, a hundred and what, 140 years later, is still widely used in optical shops. So you have a source, light comes down, uh, illuminates whatever it is you're testing, and it illuminates a reference surface, and these two beams go back, and with your eye or your camera, you look in there, and you'll see interference fringes, and uh, uh, the classical way of interpreting these fringes be looking at how straight they are, and from the straightness, you can determine whether the piece you're, you're uh, measuring uh, has the right shape or not. You're really comparing your piece with a master piece. And uh, nowadays, as we go along here in this talk, and nowadays this is all analyzed by a computer, but for a long time it was analyzed uh, just by a person looking at it, maybe using a ruler. Go to 1881, Michelson came along and uh, Michelson, I think, knew everything there was to know about interferometry, a real genius. He um, invented this uh, interferometer, which was named after him, uh, used it in some of his uh, uh, experiments, and later won the Nobel Prize for the, the work he performed uh, using this basic interferometer. Light source, a uh, couple of mirrors, and again, the beam, two beams come down here, interfere, and you see interference fringes. Mr. Twyman and Mr. Green took what was basically the Michelson interferometer and used a small source instead of the large source that Michelson used. And they got a patent on this in 1916 and uh, used this technique for testing lenses, testing mirrors, testing prisms, and so on. And again, the basic idea, the light comes in here. You have a reference arm. Light goes up to the reference arm and out. Light goes here to whatever you're testing. If you have a good lens, then you're testing the mirror. If you have a good mirror, then you're testing the lens. And uh, down here, you'll get the interference fringes that will tell you how the optics that you're testing depart from the right shape. So that's 1916. In the uh, 60s, the laser came along, and uh, the lasers were a nearly ideal source for interferometry and really opened up the, uh, the applications of interferometry. And uh, this is basically a Twyman Green interferometer, but when they put a laser in it, they like to call it a loopy laser unequal path interferometer. So again, it's like the Twyman Green I had in the previous slide. The major difference now being with this laser is that this length of this path could be greatly different from this length, and you still would get good contrast interference fringes. And so again, it made it much easier for people to do interferometry for testing of well, optical components or machine parts or whatever. So that was 67. Then probably the next biggest change came on, well, I have to show my picture here. And once you got the laser, interferometry began, 
being used a lot more, and you, you know, you see fringes all over the place. I can always look out in the audience. I see someone with a shirt with a, some straight lines on them. I think, oh, that's an interferogram. Um, I was told not to wear an interferogram today, I guess because of the moray patterns. But Anyway, in the 70s and 80s, there was a huge change in interferometry. The computer came along, computer and improved uh, electronics and, and detectors. And every interferometer, or most interferometers after the 70s or 80s, not only do they have a light source and a beam splitter and a couple of mirrors and a lens, but they all have a computer connected to them. And probably some type of detector, uh, nowadays it would be a CCD array probably, interface to the computer. And we'll talk about phase shifting interferometry in a second, but somehow the computer is going to uh, move uh, a mirror in the system to change the path difference, and we're going to see how that's going to help us in interpreting these interferograms. So that was, you know, went on in the 70s and 80s, and it, I mean, it's still going on. If I look, you know, what really big things have happened since 1990 in interferometry, and I can come up with, with several items, but most of them really are connected with the use of, well, better computers, better detectors, and better software. Uh, all kinds of analysis software, and I, I think, again, when John Taylor's talk, when he was talking about the importance of uh, being able to model the system, and when you test it, then you can kind of feedback, and you can see, well, this optic has this particular shape. How well is that going to perform in our system when we get done? Do we, you know, do we have to improve on the fabrication, or will it work well enough the way it is, or whatever? I mean, this, this software has now become a very important part of an interferometer. Well, you know, so what's new in interferometry? Well, you know, Michelson, 100 years ago uh, or more, essentially knew about everything there was to know about interferometry. There's nothing really uh, that new. But the real thing is that in the addition of electronics and computers and software, really give you a lot of additional capabilities. And now you can really do things that, you know, you used to just be able to dream about. And uh, that's why I think interferometry is, is very exciting for us and why it's very useful for everyone in this audience. Well, I want to talk a little bit about the measurement of surface roughness. That's an area that I've played around with for quite a number of years now. And, um, it's going to be using an interferometer. It's going to be non-contact. It's going to give us uh, measurements from angstrom or even sub-angstrom on the heights to several millimeters, if you want. Uh, the spatial resolution, uh, we can get sub-micron. It certainly cannot come close to competing with the AFM that we'll hear about in the next, uh, the next talk. But uh, we can get sub-micron spatial resolution, uh, field size of you know, 100 microns or so up to several millimeters, depending on the configuration. And I'll show you results for testing all types of, of surfaces. And the basic idea is we're going to start out, we're going to have a microscope system. We're going to have a regular microscope illuminator. I'm not going to use a laser in this case, mainly because we have a lot of optics in the system. And we always have a little bit of reflection off of of each optical surface, even though we have a very good coating on it. And so it's very easy to get spurious interference fringes, and uh, that can uh, hurt the signal to noise. So we're going to use, in this case, a, a low coherence uh, length light source. We're going to use a tungsten bulb, probably put in a filter for the first part of the talk anyway. Microscope objective, here we have a well, an interferometer could be many types. I'm just going to show uh, for this talk just one type, the Moreau. So light would come down to a beam splitter up here to the reference surface, back down to the beam splitter back here. And some of the light will go down here to the sample we're looking at and then back here. And these two will interfere. And the interference pattern is going to fall on a CCD array. And this CCD array is going to be connected to a computer. Now. 
The other thing is we're looking over some area here. Where this just shows light illuminating a point, but we're actually illuminating an area here. And this area is going to be imaged on a CCD. The other thing for phase shifting, which I'll talk about in just a minute, uh, we're going to mount this reference surface here on a translator, uh, probably a piezoelectric transducer. And so we're going to be able to change the path length of uh, one arm, the reference arm, relative to the test arm. In this instrument, we're going to use two modes of operation. We're going to use phase shifting interferometry, and we're going to use vertical scanning. And uh, some of you I know are very familiar with both of these, and some of you may not be real familiar, so let me say some words about both these techniques. In phase shifting interferometry, what we're going to do is we're going to take several interferograms, and at least three, it turns out three is the smallest number we can use, three or more. For my example, I'm going to use four. So we have these interference pattern here falling on a CCD array, and then we're going to, for my example, move the reference mirror, and that's going to cause the fringes to shift, and we're going to read out three or more of these patterns, where typically we have a quarter of a fringe shift between consecutive interferograms, which corresponds to a change in the phases of the two beams of 90 degrees. And we can see how that works. Um, I had to show at least a couple of, of uh, slides with equations on them. Uh, this is the basic uh, equation for two beam interference. So this is the intensity of the light that's falling on our CCD array. It's a function of position x and y. And that intensity for the interference pattern is equal to some number, which I'll call i sub dc, plus some other value I'll call i sub ac times a cosine of the phase difference between the two interfering beams. Now, I've written this phase difference as two quantities here. And the first quantity is this phi of t. This is the phase that I'm going to change with time as I move the mirror along, as I move the reference mirror. So the other phase here, phi of xy, is what I'm trying to measure. Because once I know what phi of xy is, as we'll see in the next slide, from that, I can calculate the height variations on the sample that we're looking at. So we'll first read out the CCD array where this phi of t is equal to 0. And so that's the intensity we have falling on the CCD array. And let's say we have, well, if we had a CCD array of 256 by 256 data points, we would be reading this out at 65,000 points. Well, nowadays, you know, if I had a, a CCD array of 1,000 by 1,000 points, we would be reading this out at a million data points. And we'll store that in memory. Then the, the reference mirror move along, and this phase here will change by 90 degrees. And if we plug a 90 degrees in there, this plus cosine becomes a minus sine. We'll read that out into computer memory and store this point by point. Another 90 degrees, that minus sine becomes a minus cosine. And again, we store this data array in the computer memory. And another 90 degrees, um, this minus cosine now becomes a plus sine. I put in 270 up here. And so I'll again store this in computer memory. So we have these four data arrays stored in computer memory. Now we'll do a little arithmetic. We'll take I4 minus I2 for each, we'll do this pixel by pixel for each detector point. And so the I sub DC cancels, and I'm left with a with a 2 i sub ac sine of phi. And then I'll take i1 minus i3, i sub dc cancels, and I'm left with a 2 i sub ac cosine of phi. And so I'm left here with a sine of phi over the cosine of phi or the tangent of phi. So I calculate this at each data point. Now, I remember that the first time I calculated this was back in the 60s. And I thought, you know, this is such a simple thing you know, probably not very useful. And it took me 10 years to realize how important that equation was. And it turns out to be a very powerful equation. First off, you take, when you take these differences here, any fixed pattern noise in the detector drops out. And when you do this division here, and, and you do this pixel by pixel, so any gain variations across the detector drop out. Any intensity variations across the beam drop out. And you'll end up with a very 
low noise signal and uh, calculation here, and it enables you to measure heights down into the angstrom or subangstrom range. And so this is the phase we calculated. So I just took the arc tangent, and then if I'm looking in my interferometer at something at normal incidence, I would take whatever I calculate here, divide it by 4 pi, multiply that by the wavelength, and you get the height variations across the sample. So it's a very, very powerful, simple, you know, simple equation, but very powerful. And has been made more powerful over the years as computers have gotten faster, detector arrays have gotten larger, and electronics have gotten better. The limitation of this technique is you can't measure very large steps. You can't measure very rough surfaces. And so that takes us to our second mode of measurement here, the vertical scanning or coherence probe. And again, these techniques are not, they're not new, but by use of modern electronics and computers, they have become very powerful. The problem we're trying to solve here is, let's say I'm measuring a surface that has a step that is greater than a quarter of a wavelength. Well, I'll get fringes on this side, I'll get fringes on this side, but the problem is I can't connect, you know, I don't know if that fringe goes with that fringe, that fringe, or some other fringe. There's an ambiguity in how large this step is. And I, I could show that mathematically, but I'll just, I'm just going to state it here. Well, if we go to white light, so here I'm looking at a, uh, a grating here that has some steps. And if I go to, say, a, a uh, essentially a quasi-monochromatic light source, I look across these steps, and I can't really tell which fringe goes with which fringe. But if I go to white light, I can tell, well, you know, lo and behold, that fringe probably went with this fringe way down here. And so by going to the white light, we are gaining back some information about how large that step is. Well, we can make use of that. And the basic idea here is that, you know, a difference between the reference and test optical paths cause a difference in phase. If we go to white light, the best fringe contrast corresponds to a zero optical path difference. And we're going to make our microscope system so things are in focus best when we have a zero optical path difference. So here I'm going to have a microscope system. And I'm looking here, I have a white light source and there's an interferometer built into here. And the paths of one arm would be such that the paths for the two arms would match if the surface were at this location. Well, I don't see fringes there, but I move down here. Now I'm going to see very good contrast fringes in the center of the pattern. I change this path length a little bit more. Now the best contrast fringes is beginning to move out. I'll go a couple more here. Now it's moved way out here. Do one more. And now, as I look in this position, the best contrast fringes is out here. So now what I can do, if I set up my interferometer and I move through focus, and my computer keeps track of where the contrast is a maximum as a function of vertical position here, I can map out the shape of the surface. And here's looking at a sample, just showing the same thing again, looking at a sample which was a, a piece of, micro machine piece of silicon, I guess. Here we have very good contrast fringes here and not good contrast fringes there. Now I change the focus and I'm going to get good contrast fringes here and not good contrast fringes there. So again, I'll scan through focus. Computer keeps track of where the fringe contrast is a maximum. It's a function of focus position. And I can map out the shape of the surface, even if I have a large step. And so it's the same basic interferometer we had before. Except now I don't put in the filter. I use white light for the whole thing. And now I'm going to translate this assembly here through focus. And again, keep track of the computer, or keep track of the fringe contrast of the signal. Probably the, you know, one of the biggest limitations of the use of interferometry is vibration. And uh, with uh, vibration present, the results you get are often incorrect. And so there is a lot of interest now in some way getting around the vibration problem. And uh, I mean, one way would be if you could just take the data faster, but that's much easier said than done. Another way would be to control the environment, get rid of the vibration. Sometimes that's very difficult to do. 
Another is to use a common path interferometer so both the reference and the test beam see the same vibration. Again, that is, uh, is difficult to, to do. In, in some cases, it's easy. In many cases, it's difficult to do. And the last is to grab all the frames at once. We're doing phase shifting, so we're taking three, four, or five frames. Let's get them all at once and real fast and uh, freeze the vibration. And that is probably the, the, uh, the best approach. There's some problems calibrating it, but I'll show a system that seems to work very well. Well, as I said, one approach is you sense the, the vibration. So you sense the optical phase of the fringe pattern. And as it's jumping around, then some way you feed back a signal uh, that introduces vibration 180 degrees out of phase. And uh, we recently built one of these systems, and uh, it worked uh, pretty well. And this is showing, uh, with the feedback system turned on, the fringes were fairly stationary. Now, uh, we'll see here again in a second. So feedback is working, and the fringes are fairly stationary, and now they're jumping all around and you can't see them. And so it does a pretty good job of freezing the, uh, or canceling out the vibration, and it works pretty well. But it's rather complicated and expensive, and it's a nice, nice academic exercise, I guess I would say. But a better approach is something I, I ran into recently um, uh, from a, uh, a spin-off from a company called uh, Metro Laser that uh, uses the following technique. And this slide, I think I violated all the rules that you uh, sent us to not violate. Uh, so I know no one can read this, but I'll tell you what we're doing here. So we have a Twyman Green interferometer. The two arms of the interferometer, the two beams, have orthogonal polarization. And so now the two beams are coming out here, going to our detector. We're going to put a holographic element in here that is going to split that beam into four separate beams. So we're going to have four interferograms. Then right in front of this detector, we put in a phase mask now, I said these two beams have orthogonal polarization. So we're going to put in a wave plate here with a different retardation in each of the four regions. One would be, well, retardation of zero, retardation 90 degrees, retardation 180, retardation of 270. And so we will get the four interferograms all at once on one detector. Uh, and we could take it very fast. We'll freeze the vibration. And this seems to work very well. Even if you have a, a system here where you, know, they, you have a lot of vibration, so the fringes are jumping around, the relative phases of these four interferograms will remain the same, the 90 degree steps between consecutive interferograms. And you can get very good data. This is some results that the people took where they had a half meter diameter mirror that was 20 meters away, no vibration isolation, no Newport tables, no Mellis Grill tables, whatever. Um, and they were getting a very good, what I thought for this situation, a good repeatability of five nanometers RMS. So the future, you know, I think, you know, interferometry is a very, very powerful tool. It's also a lot of fun to play with. And uh, due to advances, you know, electronics and computers and software, you know, the limitations are really limited only by a person's imagination. So I thank you.